Welcome to Purdue University College of Science Superheroes of Science podcast. I'm Stephen. And I'm Sarah. We will be discussing anything and everything related to the science classroom and interviewing scientists. Because as we know, the scientists are the superheroes behind the science. So join us as we learn about the scientists and explore current trends in K-12 science education. We have Dan Shavaz with us for this edition of Superheroes of Science. And Dan is an assistant professor for atmospheric science. And we are pleased to be speaking with him today. The Hurricane Wrangler. You forgot that part. AKA the Hurricane Wrangler. Yes. That's your new title. <laughs> We've come up with it. <laughs> now so I see welcome, why, Dan. Why recording podcasts is so fun. <laughs> <laughs> we think it's fun. No, yeah. I mean, usually when you listen to a podcast, the people doing it are just laughing constantly. Like in the background, there's always like this background level of like trying to hold in laughter. See? I can see why. They're having fun. They this are. is great. You're supposed to have fun. I agree. But you have to have fun and tell the world what you do, research-wise. Sure, yeah. So I study extreme weather and climate in general, and my main focus has been on hurricanes and tornadoes. And my interest is really on the climate side of how the climate system controls hurricane and tornado activity and severe thunderstorm activity issues. All right, so what do you mean by climate system? Yeah, so I get a basic question. So a simple question we actually don't really know the answer to is why do we have, we have about 100 hurricanes a year. Uh, globally, and we don't know why. Why don't we have a thousand? Why don't we have ten? Um, and um, another relevant question is, you know, here in the eastern United States and eastern North America is kind of the hot spot for severe thunderstorms and tornadoes on Earth. And so, what about the um, say the? We know that the Rocky Mountains and we think the Gulf of Mexico have some role in creating the environments where these types of um, extreme weather can occur, but we actually don't really have a lot of deep fundamental understanding of, of you know, what does it take to create an, an area on a planet like Earth where to have severe weather, to have severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. So what is it about, if you doubled the size of the, the height of the Rocky Mountains, what would change? Um, How do you test that? So we, good question. So we test that um, using, um, so we use global climate models, um, which are, have been historically used. So these are computer models of the climate system, the atmosphere, and maybe the ocean as well, um, and the land surface. And um, these are models that um, have, are most commonly used to simulate, say, the past 30 years and then maybe out into the next 100 years to say. So, for example, they're often used for things like um, doing projections for climate change, how the climate will, um, we think the climate may change over the next 10, 100 years, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but so what we do is try to use these same models as experimental tools to say, well, what if we modified the Earth in some way? So as a simple example is we do, um, I've done a fair amount of experimentation where you just remove all the land. What happens on a world we call an aqua planet that's just covered in water? So would you expect there to be severe thunderstorms? Would you expect there to be hurricanes? If so, where? And can we understand just kind of the basic physics of, of where they form and how they move and how they behave? Yeah. So. Do you have like the new grad students watch? Yeah, the Kevin Costner Waterworld before they do this. <laughs> that's exactly no, I that's should. That's a great idea. I've never even seen Waterworld myself. Oh, I'm actually oh. very bad at seeing all of the the uh, catastrophe movies. Oh, you have to so, get out of the computer model. I know it's true. Well, I cause I when I grew up. So I grew up terrified of the weather, which is actually how I got into it. But it was really I I loved the weather, but I I was very scared as a child. I thought I was scared of the weather and of aliens. Um, and I thought, uh, and so I grew up in Wisconsin where we had these, we had big thunderstorms like we do here in Indiana. Um, and so overnight I would frequently think when I'd see a big flash of lightning that there were aliens also coming to take over. So I was a scared child. So I have some, I have a kind of a love hate relationship or love fear relationship with the weather and weather movies and whatnot. So water world isn't, well, I know water world's kids. different. Yeah, I, yeah. I think yeah. I just remember everyone said it's water world was bad. So happened. I didn't watch it. Well, yeah. I think the critics did, but yeah, it's, yeah. you know, it, I loved it. Yeah. It's like one I of the first DVDs I had. I don't know why. I, yeah, I mean, I I have nothing against it. I just have not actually watched it. <laughs> well, so, But that's a great thing. idea. I never thought. I really uh, should uh, actually oh, go yeah. watch that and now put that in. Anytime I talk about my research, I've never thought about that. Because that's like a completely <laughs> obvious connection there. So this is great. So I would just throw so random, random clips from Waterworld yeah, in, in the middle know, of your presentations. That'd be great. <laughs> I'm totally and we expect human mutations <laughs> for uh, gills in the ears. Those are aliens. That's awesome. 
<laughs> I'm I not here to help you. Yeah, this is fantastic. This is so great. See, this is why. See, we get stuck. We're scientists. We get stuck sitting in our little experimental world doing our science, and then uh, we miss, sometimes we miss some really great things going on around us. <laughs> like the opportunity of pro human adaptation and guilt. I like that. <laughs> well, Dan, I want to go back. You said you you got interested because you started with sort of a fear of the weather. So how did that then transition into your path that you're on now? Yeah, so, I mean, so my origin story is when I was um, almost five, and there was a big uh, thunder, a severe thunderstorm. It was not a tornado, but a straight-line wind event, and uh, I was in the basement, and the power was out, and then a tree fell on our house. Um, wow. And so and it didn't break through, but it, sh- it sounded like all the windows in the house broke, and actually that sound was just... Um, the shingles sort of shattering, I guess, on the roof. Mm. Um, but so that was one of my first memories, and so that was what set off my like terrible fear and also obsession with the weather growing up. So growing up, I just loved the weather. I was a big weather geek. By the time I got to college, I was... I didn't really know what I was going to do, and at the time hadn't really thought about, you know, studying the weather, and I went in as an engineer, but then after a semester um, in undergrad, I was at Wisconsin, uh, I just was like, I don't know, this isn't really for me, but I always like, I like math and physics, and I've always loved the weather, so it seems like they have an atmospheric science program, so I joined that, and that was what I did my undergrad degree in, and then while I was there, I did a research project where I just said, hey, can I do some research, and someone put me on a project on hurricanes, and so that sort of started me in the hurricane direction, and then I went to grad school and continued working on that, and then now since I've come here, I still work on hurricanes, but I'm actually shifting fairly significantly now towards severe thunderstorms and tornadoes, which is more relevant here in the Midwest. Um, obviously, people always ask me, why do you study hurricanes in Purdue? There's no, <laughs> not, a lot no, of hurricanes not a lot of hurricanes here. Hurricane, hurricane remnants pass through sometimes, yes. but not very exciting. Uh, yeah, and so that's something that's, uh, like, I can study hurricanes anywhere. It's all on using data and computer models. Um, but it's kind of nice in this department, especially, there's a lot of people who do severe weather and that has a long history here at Purdue of doing um, uh, severe weather research, severe thunderstorm research. And so, um, yeah, so I've sort of shifted back to that and that was a little bit closer to my heart growing up so very nice so what's the most surprising thing you've found in your data that you didn't want to believe <laughs> interesting question what's the most surprising well, you didn't thing? expect a straightforward question <laughs> from you. come on i think the most surprising thing i would say which is maybe relevant to people is these climate models like i said we work with these global climate models to do experiments and studying hurricanes for a long time people have studied hurricanes in kind of simpler models where you just kind of make one hurricane in a box and what we're trying to do and this is something that i don't think i believed was possible and there's a lot of people who still kind of are skeptical of that you can use like, like hurricanes form in the climate system like within the atmosphere on earth and so being able to study hurricanes using a climate model of the whole earth or the whole earth's atmosphere i should say uh i would have never expected to learn so much about hurricanes f- using these models i'd always thought of them as sort of like i said they're usually used to just make projections for the future so how do we think that you know how much will it warm up or cool down uh, or I mean, how much do we think it will warm up over the next hundred years, um, um, things like that. We started working with these models to say, what if we just tinkered with the Earth? What if we think about these differently, these models as, as again, these kind of experimental testing grounds? Can we use them to understand weather? Um, and I think that instead of climate, so you kind of these average properties is what it's typically used for, but can we start to understand weather? And even things like hurricanes, which are smaller in scale, um, and now we're starting to look towards tornadoes and severe thunderstorms, which themselves are not. So hurricanes can be represented reasonably well in a climate model, but you don't. It doesn't. The model won't actually produce severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. But there are other parameters that you can study that are important gr- ingredients for creating tornadoes and severe thunderstorms. And so these are all things that are, to me, I think of as weather that. I don't think I would have ever thought a climate model would be useful for, but now I, th- <clears throat> now I think the opposite. I think the weather is something that comes out of the climate system, um, and so you to understand how weather may change with climate, how hurricanes may change with climate change, or tornadoes may change with climate change, it's so much more useful, I think, to put it in. You need to have the full climate context. Like You need to model the whole system or model a system like our, our Earth's climate to to be able to think about 
how the weather works, <laughs> I guess, on Earth. And like so that's something that I would have never thought about. And I still now, you know, as I've learned these things, it's sort of the things that I try to preach in some sense when I talk about my work um, and my group's work is, is how useful these are as tools um, in, in trying to understand weather. So I think weather and climate, the communities have historically been pretty separate. The climate world doesn't really think about the weather too much. Mm -hmm. It's sort of just like noise. And then the weather people love the weather. They, they care about the things happening around them every day, um, you know, including like chasing tornadoes or whatever it is. Um, but then they're not usually thinking about the broader climate context. They think of a oh, thunderstorm that's, you know, like um, that's something that's small that passes over you quickly. Um, and so it's much smaller than like the whole climate system. But I think I've been amazed at how they're actually, how intimately related they are and how you can use these climate models to really study the weather um, and, and be able to put it in this climate context. And I think that's really important, especially since our climate is changing. So. Dan, I was a chemistry teacher for a number of years, and I hear you saying these were weather and climate, yeah. and I don't know that I had ever thought too much about what those were. I, I suppose I didn't think they were synonyms, but what is, so for someone that doesn't know, a basic yeah, yeah. definition for weather, a yeah. definition for climate. Yeah, yeah, it's good. I literally just taught this in my class yesterday. Um, right. but, uh, <laughs> I mean, so the typical, so what I'll say first is the typical answer is, so weather Weather is sort of like day-to-day -day variability in any particular place. And the thing I like to say is, personally, because I find this more useful, is that weather is sort of what you feel. So when you say, I'm cold, I'm hot, it's raining, it's snowing, um, whatever, those are the kinds of things that, to me, I think are they're, they're tangible. Like, what do we feel um, when you go outside <laughs> um, as weather on a day-to-day -day basis? So, and you can expand it to say, you know, what is it that you measure on a day-to-day -day basis of things? The weather is always changing. Um, and then climate is, you know, is typically thought of as sort of a longer term average, let's say, of, of the weather. So the most standard definition is 30 years, um, like the average temperature over 30 years. Um, and so I think that's the simplest way to put it. Um, in general, I just think of climate as some sort of the statistical properties of weather. So that could just be an average. Um, but it, it might be like, for example, the seasonal cycle to me is more climate. That's not weather. We know that in July, in the summer, it's going to be warmer here in the northern hemisphere than in January during the winter. So the seasonal cycle is something that's really more climate. It's not a single average temperature, but it's it's kind of it's something that is uh, that varies more slowly, I guess, okay. over time. So. It's something, yeah, if because our, especially because our climate is changing, I think that's the big, always the big question is what's going to happen in the future. And so um, in general, I guess my philosophy is to know what, if you want to know what's going to happen in the future, it helps to know in general how does, you know, if you, whether you make things warmer or cooler um, or like how does weather respond um, no matter how you change things. And if you have that broader understanding mm -hmm. um, of that connection from this large scale climate down to the, the weather, and, and I think that's important because weather is the thing we care about. Like I said, I think about weather as what you feel. And at the end of the day, that's what matters is what, that's what affects people mm -hmm. um, on a day to day basis. And so, um, and so having a deeper understanding of that connection rather than just saying, let's just forecast out for the next hundred years, which is useful. Um, but maybe you make that forecast, but you don't really like, and you have a forecast that says, you know, there'll be more hurricanes, there'll be more tornadoes. But if we don't really understand it, um, I think a, you have a little bit less confidence. You're not totally sure. Like, do we really believe that forecast? Um, and then just in general, it's, it's, it's nice. I mean, maybe this is a little more just being a scientist as we're interested in understanding also. So um, it's great to know what to be able to predict the future. But can we under if we have like a more general physical understanding of how climate and weather are related to each other? Um, that's a really nice. Um, that's just yeah, means we understand our world a little bit better, which is nice. Well, let me throw as an outreach person, especially for Earth atmospheric planetary sciences, I get approached by a lot of people. Yeah. And uh, I do my best to answer questions, but uh, I'm curious to know if, if I've been answering uh, one particular question <laughs> correctly. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to throw at you that it's for, the same question I've been for some people it's a little political, and I don't understand why, but it is. Yeah. But uh, you've mentioned two or three times now that the, the climate is changing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What is climate change? What is changing? I would well, echo Stephen's question here because I'm thinking this too, having come from the classroom several years ago. Mm -hmm. That was a question that came up a lot. 
students here have been hearing this in the news, this climate change, mm-hmm. and they're hearing things at home. And then, of course, I'm just a chemistry teacher. I, I'm teaching what I'm teaching, but I hear it too. And we want to make sure that we're giving the right information. And you're someone in the know. You're someone doing research on this now. So sure, yeah. I'm very interested to hear your... Sure, yeah. I mean, so generally when we talk about climate change, I mean, we're talking about this um, fact that as humans in society, we've been um, using, well, doing different things, including using fossil fuels to um, that have been emitting um, carbon dioxide and methane and other what we call greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And so that's been gradually increasing the amount or the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which are these um, gas, these molecules that they're very, they're not... A, they're relatively low abundance in the atmosphere, but what they do is they essentially um, trap heat in the system by absorbing um, energy that would otherwise be emitted out to space. So we're some people liken it to like there's like a thin transparent blanket in the atmosphere that we're thickening, and so that's keeping more energy in the system, um, and so that causes things to warm up. And so this is where we talk about climate change. We're thinking about um, the, that we expect the atmosphere to warm up gradually um, and potentially more rapidly um, for at least the next hundred years and possibly much longer than that. So. When you say warm up, I mean, it's going to be like Mars type of <laughs> no, Well, so it's... What, what it's, do I need to expect? Here? Yeah, so that's a good question. A so, so we don't know. I mean, so the, you know, it's, it's warmed about uh, one f- degree Fahrenheit, I believe, in the last... 75 years and that's expected to accelerate um so i always forget the exact range but um you know, for 100 years from now there's a pretty wide range of possibilities but it could be anywhere from um like two or three degrees warmer fahrenheit to something like 10 degrees warmer fahrenheit and within that range there's a big there's things like um whether ice sheets could be melting um significantly or um so certainly been glaciers. Question. I was gonna ask well, a couple of degrees pff, right, yeah, right. That by lunch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, so, what's the big deal? Yeah, so right, so what is the big deal? So I mean, um yeah, so you think of the average temperature warming up that doesn't sound very interesting, but there's a lot of different implications. One is just when the average warms up, usually the extremes warm up more and so there's oh. things we definitely expect um, you know, summers, say here in Indiana in a hundred years, it's pretty likely that we'll have many, many more days of say 90 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is what people often feel as saying that's really hot. Mm-hmm. Um, and then even fairly frequent hundred degree days. And so, and then, and so that has, there's human health implications, there's implications for agriculture, all sorts of things. Um, and then with it comes changes in precipitation patterns. So where is it going to rain? Um, we expect generally that when it rains, it rains harder. So things like flash flooding is definitely a big, um, I expect it to become a, a much bigger concern moving forward. Um, and then there's things like uh, sea level rise. So if we melted significant um, uh, land ice, that, that that ice goes into the water and raises the sea levels. And so this is the kind of thing where the issues are that society has built up infrastructure along the coast. So, and whether that's in an industrialized world like here, where we have like places like New York City, where we have lots and lots of buildings and people who live on the coast, um, <clears throat> or if you're in a place like India or Bangladesh, where you just have millions of people who live on the coast there, but um, are much less capable of adapting um, because they have they don't have the means. Um, there's an element of it that you know people often say, oh, the climate's always been changing. And it's like, okay, that's true, but our society has developed in a rel- in the last couple hundred years, really, um, for this climate. And so, if we change it significantly, um, it's not that we can just up and move everything. Um, and there are things that we'll be able to adapt to, but there are things that we may not be able to. So, um, yeah. So the so at the end of the day, when we talk about climate change, it's that yes, the we expect the atmosphere to warm up on average, but really then, as we said before, climate changes in climate translate to changes in weather and all sorts of other things. And so it really there's. Um, a lot of uncertainty, but there's also just, we know that there's a lot of things that are going to change in terms of the things that impact our um, daily lives and our economy and our society. And so some of those things we may be able to be able to adapt to and others we may not. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, so I mean, that's to me, sometimes people say, oh, there's uncertainty, so we should just wait. And it's sort of the other way around. I think it's, 
you know, it's something to be concerned about um, because we don't know exactly how things are going to change. So, so I, I hear people say, "Oh, it's just natural cycles; it yeah, always goes yeah. up." And always, yeah. you know, are, are we going to hit an ice age? That's the question I love. Uh, it's getting warmer; that means we're going to get an ice age soon, right? Right, right, right. And so people think next year we're going to be covered with a foot of ice. Yeah, right. You know, in two years it's going to be a mile of ice. Right, right. And so, those are questions. That yeah, yeah, no, it's tough. I mean, those are the kinds of things. Those are real science questions. It's not that they're they're uh, misguided. I think it's just you know we don't like scientifically. There's been so much work trying to say really just to say are there other explanations for the fact that things have been warming up and we just don't really have any good explanations, particularly for the last seventy five years. Um, so going back to the mid twentieth century is that um, we we know. We don't have other explanations that seem viable for explaining the warming that we've seen so far. And then the other side of it is really on, and this is something I try to emphasize, but is a little bit more advanced, is like there's basic physical understanding of like we can measure how much energy is being emitted to space and we can see that that is decreasing as we increase greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere and the the physics of that is actually very simple they're very universal laws it's not something specific to atmospheric science these are laws that govern the universe in general and so um, the idea that if you increase greenhouse gas concentrations that you'd expect the atmosphere to warm up is something that has really been known for probably, I don't know, I think it goes back to the mid-19th century. People have kind of made that prediction at a general level to say, hey, this this is pretty basic science to say that you think things will warm up. So so the tough part is in for our real world today is if people want to know, okay, exactly how much is it going to warm up? Exactly Uh-oh. how is that going to change things? And this is where, again, um, my point is we can't tell you exactly how things will change. Yeah. Um, and, and, but that doesn't mean you can't wait for us to know exactly how things will change. <laughs> Those that'll, you know, you're whatever like that. We'll never have that certainty. Um, uh, but we're pretty certain things are changing. You know, we're pushing the ball down the hill and something, things are going to change and things may change more slowly or more rapidly than we think. That's why we think about this problem a lot. <laughs> we do experiments where we say, what if we change the earth or what if we think of worlds that are different from the earth? Mm. Um, and so that is sort of accidentally brought me much closer to the world of planetary science. Ooh. And so, again, for me, in, in the case, so actually this is a good point. So in the case of weather, I was terrified but fascinated to know more. In the case of aliens, I was terrified, but I had, so I didn't want to know anything about it. So I actually don't really know anything about space. Um, but I have sort of accidentally started veering towards kind of exoplanet research. Um, and so have been hearing more about, you know, what do we actually understand about whether we think there's life out there. And so... So that would be cool. I think Happy. now yeah. I would be. That would be. I'm definitely not afraid of, of aliens. That would be really exciting if we found some. Well, aliens. or or life in general. I like the fact that you went. I mean, to the planetary thing. We haven't talked to a planetary person yet, but it's. I mean, planetary people ask me. Oh, so you study star stuff? I'm like, no, no, no. We yeah. we we apply what we know about the Earth to other planets. Mm-hmm, right. There's more a better description. I think. And so I like the fact that you've talked about the climate and the whole atmospheric, the whole system. Mm-hmm. how things are working, and then you can take that knowledge, what we collect here, and start looking at other planets. Right. How, are, how is this planet working, and how is it, based on what we know right. here, what variables are different, so what can happen there. Right, right. And it, to me, that is just mind-blowing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's cool, and it's, uh, it's very under, like, it's a totally new field. It's a totally new area, and I can, like, the Earth people have been very focused on studying just the Earth as it is today in terms of the atmosphere. And then I think my sense is the planetary world, because maybe we just haven't had the models or the data necessarily to do a lot with their they have they study a lot they study a lot about planetary formation and um, some about the climate, but there's definitely a convergence um, I think between the two fields that'll emerge over the next I mean it's happening now, but I think over the next decade or two where um, where the yeah, like you said, we can apply our expertise that has been very earth focused to helping to better understand climates of other planets um, and and thinking about and that's someone there's Stephanie Olson who um, is an incoming professor will start next year. Um, she studies this very she's very interested in this question of understanding habitability on other planets. Oh. Um, so yeah, so there's kind of a convergence. I think there there will be a gradual convergence on this. Um, 
but because uh, yeah, the Earth we've studied so much of it, but it's just been very, very entirely focused on the Earth. So now we're going um, to space. The now we're going, yeah. Frontier. I mean, mm-hmm. well, like I said, it's sort of like okay, we understand. There's things we understand. It's sort of like we've been focused looking in the box, the Earth box, the whole time. But now it's like if you zoom out, it's like what are there things? I think it actually can go both ways. Like what is it about that we've learned about the Earth that can be taken to other planets? And then also what are the things if we start to broaden our view and study other planets that we could actually come back and learn about Earth? So and that's a little bit like I said, my research. Like one of the things we've done is is to, for studying these hurricanes on these these water worlds, these aqua planets, is to say, what if we took that planet and spun it twice as fast, or make it twice as big, or spun it half? So it was rotating, so rotating twice as fast, or rotating half as fast. What happens? And those are the experiments where we're testing certain hypotheses. But this is again, it's starting to say, okay, let's broaden our view and think of Earth as a planet, but there are other planets as well. And so, can we just generally understand how planets work? Um, and that might that I think there's a two-way street there of learning more about our own planet by studying other planets, and then also taking what we've learned about our planet to learn more about other planets. So how do you focus on research? <laughs> so I, that's I mean, it's a great. It's endless. It's, 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 how do you focus on anything? We have a lot of. I would have a different you question mean, every hour and never get anything done. We have a lot of teachers that are interested in doing research at the high school level, but oh, yeah. I think it's really overwhelming at yes. first to. For for myself as a teacher yeah. to think of okay how do I come up with questions and then yeah. to teach your students then to develop these questions yes. so what I mean that's extreme I think that's actually an, a very underrated or under what's the word um, undervalued how difficult that is I think you the answer is. I don't even know, like, like all this research came for me, I just was studying hurricanes, and then it sort of just said, okay, well, what if we study the hurricanes in these Earth models, and then we said, what if we changed a couple of things in our Earth model, and then, and it was sort of, I almost want to say it's by accident, and that, like, I never had intended, I, at no point, like I said, I was afraid of aliens, I never thought about space, like, all this research took me in this direction, but I wasn't thinking about it. And you're right, maybe if I was, I would have just been totally overwhelmed. So I don't know. So like, so my short answer is, is I don't know how you pick. You just do. And it's, it's a hard thing. It's a real problem. I mean, it's part of even in graduate school and just in science in general. It's very easy to, like, I struggle with this where I have a lot of interests. And, and you have to narrow, you have to, you have to pick directions. Because otherwise you could spend all your time thinking and none of your time, like, finishing anything. Right. And that's hard. And so it's... I don't think there's a simple answer, and I think, I would guess if you asked, if you polled scientists, you'd find that a lot of them would tell you, oh, I struggle with that all the time. So it's tough, and that's that's the thing, is you, no one solves all of science at once. <laughs> Most people, you you pick kind of one, where, one or two areas that you're really focused on, and you spend several years on it, or maybe your whole career on it, and so, yeah, you have to learn to put blinders on, otherwise you'll... Like, you put blinders on, but then you take, you you know, it's also important to take them off sometimes and talk to other people and find out how what you're doing may be relevant for other other fields. So, which I think is also an important part. In science, sometimes you do do research. Like, I think it's great that we support, especially in the U.S., support, support kind of general science for science sake. Because it's like, sometimes you do stuff and someone just works on it, I think, for three years. And, and while they're working on it, they couldn't tell you why it's important. But then a few years later... Somebody else says, hey, this is really important for what I'm doing. I'm so glad you spent those three years figuring that out because now we can solve a different problem that you would have never realized you needed to solve. So, Which brings us to the communication so, of science. Mm, yeah. Because that's another part that we kind of failed just a little bit in our K-12 science world. Mm. That we for, we'll do it, but then oftentimes students don't get to communicate what they're researching well. Mm, yeah. But that's something as a scientist you guys do all the time. Yeah. Well, we try to, yeah. Well, and good. some do better than others. <laughs> <laughs> what are different ways that you communicate what you're finding, what you're researching out to others? Yeah. So, I mean, the most common way is just we go to, we have science conferences where we get together and they can be broad science conferences, like an atmospheric science conference where scientists from all different subfields will come in and talk about whatever they're working on, or you can have very focused conferences or workshops. But So at each of these, what you're doing is giving a, something like a 15 minute talk about your science where you're really trying to distill down what is the what are you trying to understand better what is your focus and then what are you know your methods and your results um, and 
uh, yeah, and Pete said different scientists share what they're working on in that way. Um, so that's been the traditional way to do it, and I think it's still the most common, and it's the best. It gives you, you bringing scientists together so they have a chance to interact, to learn from each other, um, to go talk to each other, and to build new, um, you know, new science directions, um, or to get feedback from each other, because sometimes you go and you, you're thinking about your science in one way and you give a talk about your science and somebody else says, hey, have you thought about this? And um, you learn from that and, um, and go and kind of build from there. Cool. Well, thank you. Sure. This Thanks was for good. Having, Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you love superheroes of science, be sure to subscribe, rate, and give a review on iTunes or your preferred podcast player. Be sure to join us as we add interviews of scientists and incorporate discussions of current trends in K-12 science. Until next time, be super, and remember, you are someone's hero. Boiler up. Hammer down.